Welcome. Welcome all to our Sunday Worship at Holy Sepulchre. It is, is always wonderful, wonderful to gather, and it's particularly wonderful for me, given I've been uh, away for a few weeks with, uh, as you know, COVID. We are all back to health, so, um, or coming back to health for some of those who are a little bit more fatigued. So thank you all for your prayers and concerns and your messages. Uh, it's is one of the wonderful aspects of communities whereby we reach out to each other and remind ourselves that we are not alone and uh, that the community is with us, praying for us. And so thank you. It is a huge difference. So as we uh, gather, let us uh, start with uh, a prayer to remind us that God is with us always. Loving God, we come together to worship you this day, knowing that you are always with us, you are always hearing us, always alongside us, always lifting us up, always before us. We pray that as we gather today, that we will each feel your presence, that we will each be transformed by you. that we will know that those things that are troubling us, you can lift off us. The concerns that we have for loved ones, you will hold on to and come close to them the concerns that we have for our own lives, the things that are troubling us, that you will take them with your infinite love, your infinite grace, Lord. So we thank you that all that you do, and we pray that as we worship you this day, that we will bring glory to you and help more to know you this day. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Let me pass over to you, Tom. Thank you. Every 
tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose. So come, now is the time to worship. Now is the time to give your heart. Come just as you are to worship. Come just as you are before your God. Thank you for saving me. What can I say? You are my everything. I will sing your praise. You shed your blood for me. Took my sin and shame, a sinner called by name. Grace is the Lord. Grace is. Thank you, Lord, that you set your hope in me, me of all people. And um, God, you take us, you, you 
take us and you understand us for who each of us are. Um, and how great would it be if we could give you as much back as you give to us. Um, and we'll try in, in, in every way we can, Lord. And I know that's a promise you hear a lot, but um, we'll do what we can. <laughs> Tom, thank you. Thank you. Great worship songs and link to a message that we will hear shortly, I hope, and uh, a little bit about offering ourselves and how important it is that as we offer ourselves, our lives can become transformed by that. But let us first, as a community, let us uh, bring our prayers together. So let us pray. Everlasting God, after a week in which we had the city prayer breakfast, where 150 odd gathered together, where we as a community were good stewards, we offered ourselves to serve others and enable this gathered with others and prayed with others. We pray for all who are disciples of Jesus today, all those in this city, around our nation and around the world. And we ask that your Holy Spirit will pour into our hearts 
will pour into our hearts and that all will find themselves encouraged to give of themselves, of ourselves. We pray that we will be true examples of selfless giving, of service to others, shown by you, Lord, who always sought to reach out to others, to be there for others, to restore the broken and the hurt, and to be gathering all people together. To Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. At a time, Lord, when many are still struggling with COVID, we pray for our families and friends, our colleagues and neighbours. We pray that all in our communities will be an understanding of others, understanding of those who need to be protected who feel concerned with the world. Help each of us to be understanding, Lord, of their context, of their situation. And to be supportive of all around us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray also, Lord, for those who are ill, those who are caring for others, whether that be physical, mental, or spiritual concerns, caring for old people, caring for siblings, caring for neighbors, caring for children. We pray for those that you will fill them, Lord, with your compassion and your strength. We know that at times it can be exhausting for those who care for others. But Lord, that we ask that you strengthen each and every one of us and all those who can reach out so that whatever is happening in somebody else's life, they know that they are loved, they know that they are cared for, that they know that they will have somebody alongside them always, reaching out in your name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we got at the end of a week in which an MP has lost his life. And we know that all we lost are promoted to glory, but those who are left behind are hurting, struggling with the loss. We pray for his family and friends and all those who work with him. We pray for other MPs and all those who are in public service. That this just reminds them of the risks they take. We pray that they will be, continue to be encouraged in their desire to serve this nation. That the ongoing abuse that they receive that somehow, Lord, we will find a solution which you know there will be. Help us to find it, Lord, so that we build a world whereby it's your values 
that are the values that we live by. We pray for our nurses, our teachers, all those in our public services, that at this time of our health service being overwhelmed, at this time of our schools still struggling, at this time when they're most vulnerable in the greatest need, Lord, we pray that those in leadership will do the right things. That we'll all be supportive of doing the right things, of all being prepared to take our share in building a better place, building a, a community, building a better nation that cares for all people, that brings all together. And now let us each, in the silence that follows, let us each bring to God the concerns that we have on our own heart. So merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And if Ruth can pop the Lord's Prayer on, let us unmute if we would like to, and in whatever language one would like to, let us, let us say the words of the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, Father in heaven, hallowed be your, your name. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, come. Your, your will be done, will be done on, on earth, earth as in as heaven. In heaven. Give, give us today, today our, our daily, daily bread. bread. Forgive, forgive us, us our sins, sins. as, as we, we forgive those who sin against us. us. Lead us Lead not into temptation, temptation, but deliver us from evil. evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now, now and, and forever. forever. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> And Ruth, would you mind uh, the reading, please? Thank you. I will, just one moment. <clears throat> reading from Mark 10, starting at verse 35. James and John, sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, what is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the 10 heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, you know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers, lord it over them and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you, you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you, must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, 
and to give his life a ransom for many. Oh, I just realized on mute, apologies. Thank you. I love the opening of today's reading from, from Mark with the disciples saying, Jesus, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Those disciples are a bit self, selfish, aren't they? Because clearly we would never, ever ask Jesus to uh, do whatever we ask. I think I told you the story that uh, when I was about six or seven years old, I told my father that he wouldn't, he, I wouldn't be his friend anymore because he wouldn't do whatever I asked him. I assume I'd asked him for some sweets or some ice cream or something, and he said no. I then told him that I wouldn't be his friend, and he said, that's fine, I have enough friends, and I didn't want to be your friend anyway. Truly loving someone doesn't mean you have to say yes every time to everything. And I wonder sometimes whether that understanding of a God who loves us, truly loves us, infinitely loves us, that we have to recognize that it is through loving us. That sometimes he has to say no when we ask him to do for us whatever we ask of him. What's equally surprising about that request from the disciples is it, it follows right after Jesus has told them all that he will be mocked, that he will be spat on, that he will be flogged, that he will be killed. So on the back of that, on the back of all of what he has just told them that he will do for them, we then have this childlike request we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And so Jesus still responds. So what is it you want? But when they asked for positions of power in his kingdom, he replies that they don't know what they're asking for. Can you drink the cup? Or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? Meaning, can you submit to the suffering and agony of a selfless life? Can you give your life so that others will live? Can you endure the unfair treatment that I will? And then just like my three young boys fighting over something that they don't even know that they want or even really want, the disciples begin to fight among themselves as to whom is the greatest. And then we have Jesus responding to them and explaining that greatness is to be found in doing the work of a servant. Greatness isn't how many servers, but in how many we serve. For even the Son of God did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus had told them he was to suffer and die, to be mocked, to be spat on, to be crucified and yet their focus was on what's in it for them they had imagined this messiah king-like messiah and they wanted to be alongside him they wanted the positions of greatness and how wrong how wrong they were We still have so much of a culture in society of indulgence, of inequality. We still have, within in our workplaces, so much of a culture of power and of inequality. I had that same conversation this week at City Prayer Breakfast about why 
I do my ministry alongside a job. I had that comment again when I talk about the inequalities of the, of the city and the workplace that I see so often of, of glass ceilings, of have a look at Canary Wharf about the spread of who's in power, who are the key people who get more funding than anybody else in our entrepreneurial businesses. And we suddenly realize we are living in a society that indulges certain groups, that marginalizes certain groups, still in every aspect of society. Of society. And I wonder at times how much have we learned over 2000 years with this message being repeated time and again. My early career at Ernst Nyang or EY, where I was for 14 years was a wonderful time. I trained as a, a chartered accountant and worked around the world. But I think as I reflect a little bit, probably one of the most troubling aspects that sticks in my time, in my mind of, of my time there was the focus on career progression. We were counseled, mentored, guided to keep progressing up the ladder. No time for passengers, shape up or ship out. More work, greater responsibility was the goal. And the advice was focused on you need to do the job of the one above you, always, if you want to get on. So that actually for the person above you, their fear always is of this person coming behind them and just shifting them out of the way. So there, live a life constantly of shape up or ship out. One of those moments was when they said to me, would I work in Ipswich? And so for two years, I commuted from Wales to Ipswich. And obviously it was important that I got to Ipswich at the start of the day on a Monday. So I would get up at four o'clock in the morning on a Monday to be there for eight o'clock because I needed to be committed clearly and show that I was committed. And I had this very strange life for two years living in Hintlesham Hall. And if those just a very strange life, um, which you think would teach me a lesson. You'd think I'd go, this cannot be the way to live. I'd leave at four on a, mon on a Monday. I'd probably come back at midnight on a Friday because I get caught in the traffic coming back from around the M25 and then probably and then be work Saturday. You'd think at the end of that, I'd go, this is not not the way to be. And then they said to me, well, on the back of that, do you, will you commute to Singapore? I then spent the next two years commuting to Singapore for two years. And then you couple that learning alongside being the youngest of five and probably a Celt aspects of my life and, and a desire to improve myself, to be better than my siblings. I'm not entirely sure that humility and servanthood were even in my language, let alone part of my being. And, th and then we nurture in our workplaces a desire that's so alien to servant and leadership, that's so alien to care for self, that's so alien to just being. because it's so important that we do. And this is not the way that Jesus teaches us that leadership is. I love probably one of my favorite moments uh, as a result of my career is the verse from John chapter three, early on in Jesus's ministry, when John the Baptist's followers are getting worried about the increasing number of followers of Jesus and John, John's followers come to him and say, John, look, look at the man over there on the other side of the Jordan, the one that you testified about. Look, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. All of the followers are going to him. We need to do something. And John replied, I am not the Messiah, but I'm sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom awaits and listens for him and is full of joy 
when he hears the bridegroom's voice. The joy is mine and it is now complete. He must become greater, I must become less. I just love those final words. John, in our world, in our world was losing everything. But yet he says, the joy is mine and it is now complete. He must be greater and I must become less. I think the scale of this particular challenge to allow ourselves to become less and for others to grow, for many of us, is as big a challenge in our journey of discipleship as of anything. I came back to an active faith in my 30s outside an ice cream van. I was listening to two old ladies who talked about a funeral that they'd just been to and how sad and awful it was and the way it was done. There was no joy. There was no promotion to glory. And they said it was so sad because they compared that to a funeral a few weeks previously where there was a real joy. There was a real recognition of Christ's death and resurrection and that he would be with us all always. And it was at that moment that I had my Damascus moment and knew that I needed to come back to church. But not only did I realize and know that I was going to be called not to the, just to the church, I was going to be called to some form of ministry in the church, which was a bit of a shock. But in addition to that, I was going to be called to funeral and bereavement ministry, which was a real shock to me. And I did that for almost eight years. And perhaps what was most interesting was what my wife said when I said to her I was surprised about being called one to ministry, but particularly to funeral ministry and end of life ministry. And she said a couple of things. She said she felt it was because I was so rubbish at listening to God that I was being asked for it rubbish at stopping doing, rubbish at just being. Because I soon realized that all the stuff that I had learned at Ernst & Young, all of the layers of so-called earthly success had absolutely no relevance when I was with someone at end of life. The more of an empty vessel I was, the more I relied on Jesus to enable me, the more I realized he must become greater and I must become less. The more people at end of life found a form of peace was when there was less of me there, not more. It wasn't about me doing, it was about me being that empty vessel for God to work. The more I could offer all of my life, not just the bits I wanted to, the more, the more of God was being revealed to somebody at their most vulnerable, at their most hurting. And just a comment when we are preparing for the service that was made to me, which was these last few weeks with COVID and myself finding being bedridden for about a, about a week, perhaps is a reminder for me about learning to just be and not do. Sometimes we need a, sh a short, sharp shock from those we love, to be careful, and I'm very careful with those words, in this way to remind us, remind those words that it isn't always about doing, it's about being, offering all of ourselves. And that's the challenge of servanthood. Servant or master, we can't be both. There is no compromise, no middle way. This is about obedience to God, our commitment to others before ourselves. 
It's about being there for our neighbors, speaking up for injustice without counting the cost, reaching out to the poor and vulnerable without thinking of the impact on ourselves, being Christ-centered in the decisions we make about how we use all God's gifts, all of our time, all of our talents, all of our possessions, all of our money. That doesn't mean God will take it all. But it's either offering all of ourselves or we are potentially holding back the gifts that he's given us that will be the most important in his kingdom, that will be the most important in transforming society, will be the most important in bringing hope and certainty to others. Putting God and all others as our first priority in all aspects of life, God as master, each of us as our ser as servant, living a life for others, not ourselves. There is no halfway house to servanthood. For whoever saves his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. I don't know anybody ever heard there was a, a, an American quarterback uh, John Brody, one of the early million, million dollar, million dollar uh, sportsmen. Super famous in the American football, uh, American football uh, world. And when they did the, uh, the kicks, he used to come on and hold the ball. And there's a great moment when a sports reporter asked him sort of why, why one of the richest players why one of the superstar players is it you that comes on to hold the ball for the kicker to kick it between the field goals? And he just said, if I didn't hold the ball, it would fall over. It was just a brilliant moment. It was one of those, it's an irrelevance about the million dollars. It, it just needs somebody. Somebody has to do it. And why wouldn't it be me? I'm no more special than anybody else. And I think that's part of our challenge is to realize that in one respect, we are no more special, but also to realize we are equally special. God loves every single one of us equally, but he also loves every single one of us uniquely. He loves us as we are, filled us with gifts to do amazing things for him. I will offer up my life. That is what he asks. Are we each prepared to offer up our life? Our attitude to life, to our neighbors, to God should be the same as that of Jesus. And I know it's challenging. But he is asking each of us to do that. who being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used for his advantage, but made himself nothing. And taking the very nature of a servant, he humbled himself and became obedient to death. He asks us to humble ourselves, to take the very nature of a servant, to make ourselves nothing so that he will do infinite things with each of us. Infinite things where we can change the world we live in. We can transform the lives of the marginalized and the oppressed. We can transform the relationships with those who feel alone in the busiest city of the world. We can be part of building a better society if we humble ourselves and become obedient to death. If we allow ourselves to be made nothing, if we allow ourselves to be that empty vessel for him to fill it with all the gifts that we need. For even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve. I pray that each of us will humble ourselves and come to serve 
all other people. Amen. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, I'm going to make a little call here and say um, we should sing I Will Offer Up My Life again. Um, just off the back of that and and maybe from what Nick said that we can mean it in a different way this time. Sorry, Ruth, you've got to do the slide, I'm afraid. Lord Jesus. 
Cause when we sing you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all I feel. Wonderful, wonderful. It has, as always, been great to gather. Thank you, Tom, for leading us in, in worship. It's good to be together. Just uh, a couple of notices. I think we very briefly saw them, and I'm sure they will come back shortly. We have um, our lunchtime service on Tuesday, and we are starting um, the God at Work. So rather than uh, a short reflection in those services, we are using the God at Work uh, course, which will be on Monday as well as Tuesday lunchtime. Um, it's, a, it's a great course, uh, just and in whatever way we work. I think if you are able to join us, it's a series of 12, 10, 12 minute uh, short films that we're gonna watch uh, one a week across uh, the next uh, a few months. Come when you can, not when you can't. So if you miss some, it doesn't matter. It's wonderful if you're able to come and join us when you can. Uh, a, a couple of dates for the diary also. Um, we are doing two carol services uh, this year. Uh, one on Wednesday lunchtime on the 15th. And also on the Friday evening, the 17th. And if anybody can come up with a better word for modern carol services, that would be wonderful. I'm sure that's not what it is. We're going to sing some old stuff, some new stuff, some fun stuff. And it's just going to be about coming together and celebrating the birth of Jesus and having a good time together. Uh, Tom and some of his good friends will be leading us in uh, songs that evening. So if you are able to come, that will be fabulous. And more details are to follow. And... Also, just finally this week, there is a uh, Wednesday service as well. So if you are around, it's in person on Wednesdays and the church will be open. Uh, we will all be there. So it'd be wonderful if you come and join us in person or online. I think that is all. It would be wonderful if uh, we are able to stay for a little bit of fellowship together. And if not... Have a very blessed week. So the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and with all those you love always. So let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. <laughs>